Good morning. Our sermon passage today is in the book of James. James is located near the end of the New Testament. We will be reading chapter 4, four verses 1 through 10. Please turn there and follow along with me as I read James chapter 4, verse 1. What causes quarrels and what fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? You desire and you do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. You adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you suppose it is to no purpose that the scripture says he yearns jealously over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us, but he gives more grace? Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will exalt you. Thank you, Mariah. As she mentioned, we are continuing our sermon series in the book of James. And as we do, um, our passage this morning continues the same topic uh, that our passage from last week left off on. And that's the topic of, everybody's favorite topic of, remember? Conflict. In fact, verse 1, if you notice, James asks, what causes quarrels? and what causes fights among you? And I think for many of us, we would read that question and then our answer would be <laughs> a whole lot of things, right? Like a rebellious child, or the obnoxious coworker, or the unthoughtful family member, or our selfish spouse. I'm, I'm not saying that one. Um, some of you might be saying that one, not, not me. Um, an unkind or sarcastic, snarky word from somebody. Like, those are the things that causes fights and, and quarrels among, among us. So the reality is we, we experience conflict and fights and quarrels and for all sorts of different reasons, but we'll talk about how James answers that question here in just a moment. But the way we fight and the way we quarrel looks different among us as well, right? Like for some of us, we fight very aggressively, meaning raised voices, yelling, anger, it's, it's visible, you can tell, like they're upset, they're irritated, they're, they're angry. Nobody has to guess. While others fight and quarrel more passively, right? So your, your go-to way to fight is the silent treatment, or by hiding in, from the person that you're in conflict with and upset with. Like that's kind of your, your go-to maneuver when it comes to conflict and fighting and quarreling with, with others. It's usually for most of us, it's either fight, right, or flight. Well, this morning, in our passage this morning, James is going to give us a third option. That instead of fight or flight in terms of our fighting and our conflict and the quarrels we have with what others, James is going to give us a, a third option. He's going to give us a better way to, to handle, a better way to respond to the conflict and the fights and the quarrels that we have with others. And I don't really like the word steps, and I don't like to use the word steps very often it seems kind of cheesy, it seems kind of simpli overly simplistic, seems very mechanical, like 
It's an equation. You do this, then you do this, then you do this, then you do this, and then it will result in this. So I don't, I don't really like to use the word steps very often, but I think, and, and James isn't necessarily trying to provide some strict, rigid steps here, but I'm going to use that word this morning for a reason. And I hope by the end of this sermon, you'll see the, why that, what the reason is. But within this passage, James is going to show us like the way to respond to conflict isn't fight and it's not flight, but instead he's going to show us, he's going to give us four steps, four steps that we need to take when we experience conflict with, with other people. And so as we, we make our way through this passage, I, I hope and pray that these steps become really clear. And the reason that I, that I refer to these as steps is because I want to try and get as specific and practical and, and personal as possible. So the next time you, or maybe you're in it right now, the next time you, you experience just frustration and irritation and, and anger and you want to go to the silent treatment on somebody or explode on somebody and you just experience that conflict in your own heart of fighting and quarreling in your own heart with somebody, then my hope and prayer is that you would remember these four steps and that you would literally make your way through Step one, step two, step three, and step four. And that by going through these four steps that I think James lines out in our past this morning, that it would help you then to resolve and to address the conflict and the, the quarrels and the fights that you're experiencing in your own heart and, and with this other person. So here's step number one. It's this. It's to understand the ultimate cause of your conflict. To understand the ultimate cause of your conflict. This is it's the question again that James begins with here in verse 1. Look there with me again. He asks this question, what causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? And so again, let, let's personalize this, right? Think about the, the conflict that you most often face. The, the conflict in your own heart, the irritation in your own heart, the, the anger in your own heart, the fights and the quarrels that you experience. And ask yourself this same exact question. What is it that causes fights and quarrels between you and your spouse? What, what is it that causes fights and quarrels between you and your kids? What is it that causes fights and quarrels between you and your coworker, between you and your boss, between you and your, your friend, between you and a fellow church member, between you and your mother-in-law or father-in-law, between you and your family member, whoever it is? What, what is it that causes fights and quarrels among you? Well, here's how James answers this question. Look at the rest of verse 1. Is it not this? that your passions are at war within you. The word passions here means lust or or cravings. They mean selfish, sinful desires, selfish cravings, selfish desires and passions that we have. So stay with me here. James is saying that's the ultimate cause of our conflict with others. In other words, the ultimate cause of our conflict with others isn't outside of us. It's not the over-demanding boss. It's not the overbearing mother or father-in-law. It's not the ob- obnoxious neighbor. It's not the rebellious argumentative son or daughter. It's not the insensitive Spouse, none of these are the ultimate cause and reason for your conflict. The ultimate cause of your conflict isn't outside of you. The ultimate cause of your conflict is inside of you. 
It's the selfish desires and passions in your heart. In verse 2 then, James is going to get much more specific. He's going to get a lot more detailed about how these selfish desires in our hearts are the ultimate cause and the ultimate reason for the conflict that we experience with others. And so then look at verse 2. James says, you desire and do not have. So what do you do? So you murder. You covet and cannot obtain. So what do you do? You fight and quarrel. And so when James uses this word murder here, he's probably doesn't literally mean you you murder or kill someone. He might mean that, but he probably doesn't, it's probably not their issue. Instead, when he uses the word murder here, he's probably referring to places like 1 John 3.15, when John says that everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. Or in the Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew chapter 5, when Jesus equates anger with murder. That's probably what James means by the word murder here. But but do you see that his main point here in verse 2 that James is making here? His main point is to explain the ultimate cause and the ultimate reason for the conflict that we experience with other people. And the ultimate cause and the ultimate reason is this. You don't get what you want. It's unmet desires. It's unfulfilled expectations and longings, right? It's like a four-year-old. You don't get what you want, so you throw a fit. You throw a tantrum. That's the reason for the conflict and the fights and quarrels that you experience is that you want something really, really, really bad. And when you don't get it, you get ticked off, you get angry, you fight and quarrel with whoever failed to meet your desires and whoever failed to fulfill your desires. And so then, examples. You have this burning desire for respect. You just have to be respected. You have this burning desire to be appreciated. You You just have to be appreciated. But one day your boss or your spouse doesn't acknowledge you. They don't appreciate something that you've done. That desire for appreciation and respect isn't met. It's it's not fulfilled. So what do you do? You throw a fit. You have a temper tantrum. You have a pity party. Do the silent treatment. Whatever it looks like for you. Or you have this burning desire for comfort. For just comfort. Comfort. But then little Johnny knocks his milk off the table, spills all over the table, all over the floor, and you got to get up off the couch and go clean it up. And you blow up. Huge temper and loud voice and explode all over him. Why? Not because he spilled his milk, But because you want to be comfortable, you desire comfort, and he didn't meet your desire. He blocked it. He got in the way. He was the obstacle to the fulfillment of your desire, so he felt your wrath. Like in both of those examples, the ultimate cause of your conflict is not your boss, it's not your spouse, it's not your child. The ultimate cause of your conflict are the unmet and unfulfilled selfish desires in your heart. In the rest of verse 2 then, and then into verse 3, we see how deeply ingrained these selfish desires are, these selfish passions are in our hearts. Look at the the end of verse 2. James says, you do not have because you do not ask. Meaning the reason you don't have what you you desire is because you don't go to God in prayer and ask. But when you do go to God and ask, then look at what James says in verse 3. You ask and you do not receive. Why? Because you ask wrongly. That word wrongly could also be the word wickedly or, or evil. To spend it on your passions. We've seen that word passions before, haven't we? Same exact word that we saw in verse 1. To spend it on what? Your selfish cravings, your, your, your selfish lust, your self, selfish passions and, 
and desires. You see what's happening here? This is how ingrained, <laughs> this is how entrenched our selfish desires are in our hearts. They, they not only cause us to murder people in our hearts and fight and quarrel with people when they don't fulfill and meet our, our selfish desires, but the selfish desires in our hearts also affect our prayer life and how we pray. They cause us to pray with wrong, selfish, self-centered motives when we pray. But again, put all this together. The, the main point James wants us to see in all of this is how entrenched and ingrained our selfish desires are in our hearts. And so then this is step number one, right? Remember these steps? This is step number one that you need to take, that I need to take when we get frustrated, when we get upset, when we get angry and experience fights and quarrels and conflict with others. The next time that happens, you need to pause and you need to ask yourself, what is it right now that I desire so much that when it's not met, that it's causing fights and quarrels, that it's causing me to become angry and blow up toward this person? What do I want so bad right now that's not being fulfilled that's causing me to respond this way? What's so valuable to me, what's so important to me right now that when it's unfulfilled or blocked or threatened is causing me to go into a shell and respond with the silent treatment and to, to hide from this person. That's the first step. It's to understand the source of your conflict. It's not anybody or anything outside of you. The source of your conflict is in you. It's your selfish desires in your heart. I know that's a tough pill to swallow but it just gets worse. Step number two, after you see the selfish desires in your heart and understand that's the root of and cause of conflict with others, step number two, then understand the seriousness of your selfish desires. Understand the seriousness of them, of your selfish desires. This is a point that James goes on to make in the very next verse, in verse four, look there with me. He offers this harsh, stinging rebuke in verse 4. And he says, you adulterous people. Right? In the SV, there's an exclamation point there. So it needs to be read like that, right? You adulterous people. And here's why he calls them adulterers. We see it in the rest of verse 4. Look there with me. He says, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God. Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. So then you see the flow of thought here and the connection here, right? This is why James calls them adulterers. It's because as Christians, think about this. As Christians, who are they? And who are, who are we? we? We're the bride of Christ. Right, Ephesians chapter 5, that through faith in Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, we've been married to Christ. We've been united with Christ, to Christ. We're, the two have become one flesh. We're members now of his body. We are Christ's bride. But here James is saying that Jesus' bride has become friends with, with someone else, has become friends with the world. Which at first glance, you read that and you, you think, you're like, and you wonder like, how's that adultery? Like all married people have friends outside of their spouse, and that's not adultery. And so then why is why is James saying that friendship with the world for these Christians is adultery? 
Well, in order to answer that question, we have to un first understand what friendship would have meant in James's day and how friendship in James's day would have been, meant a whole lot more than friendship in our day. Like y'all know this, but being a friend to someone today means little to nothing. Like, I didn't go and look how many Facebook friends I have before the sermon. Not very many, but, um, but James means a whole lot more about friendship than, than this whole idea of Facebook friends. Like being a friend today with someone just means that kind of like you, you know their name, you spent some time together, you're kind of acquaintances somehow, maybe through work, maybe through school, maybe just a neighbor or some other common activity that you were both involved in or life experience that you both had together. And so, yeah, he's my friend, she's my, my friend. But that's not what friendship in James's day would have meant. It would have meant a whole lot more than just that. Instead, if you were friends with someone in James's day, it had the idea of identifying with someone. You were identifying yourself with that person. It had the idea of a deep bond, a deep unity that existed between you two, between friends. It had the idea of an intimacy and openness, a, a vulnerability that you're able to have and experience together. And because of that, then that's why James considers friendship with the world as adultery against God. It's because friendship with the world means that you're identifying with the world. It means that you're, you have a unity with the world. There's a deep bond and an intimacy between you and the world. That while at the same time that you're identifying with Jesus, you're identifying with the world. And while at the same time you have this deep bond and intimacy with Jesus, you have a deep bond and intimacy with the world. And so then James calls friendship with the world adultery. But the important question we need to ask is this. How exactly did James's readers become friends with the world? In other words, how did they specifically identify with the world and unite themselves with the world in which they live? Like, what, what did they do that made them friends with the world? Well, James told us in the passage you saw last week, right? Chapter 3, verses 13 through 18. That's the answer. That, that's how they became friends with the world. Remember last week's passage, chapter 3, verses 13 through 18? James contrasted two things. He contrasted the wisdom of God with the wisdom of what? Help me out. With the world. It's our key word, Right? And do you remember how he described the wisdom of the world in those verses? Look at chapter 3, verse 14. Here's James's description of the wisdom of the world. Verse 14 says, but it, and this is all going to sound familiar. It's going to sound just like chapter 4. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but is what? But is earthly, meaning it's the wisdom of the world. It's not the wisdom of God that comes down from above. It's the wisdom of the world, meaning again from last week that the wisdom of the world is characterized by bitter jealousy and selfish desires and ambition in our relationships with others. And this is what James means when he says that they've become friends with the world. He means that they've adopted the wisdom of the world and are following the wisdom of the world in their relationships with one another as they're, as they're living in bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in their relationships with one another. They're living out, they're buying into the wisdom of the world. And since they've done that, since they've adopted the world's wisdom and are living out the characteristics of the world's wisdom, selfish ambition and jealousy in their relationships with one another, since they become friends with the world in these ways, then James says they've committed adultery against God and been unfaithful to God. 
because instead of living according to God's wisdom in their relationships with one another, remember what those were? Humility and peace and deference and mercy, like we saw in chapter 3. Instead, they're living according to the world's wisdom in their relationships with one another. Selfish passion, selfish desire, selfish ambition, bitter jealousy, leading to all sorts of fights and quarrels. But it's even more than that, right? It's not just that they're committing adultery against the Lord when they're following the wisdom of the world in their relationships with one another. They're also, did you notice in verse 4? He says they're also becoming enemies of God. They're making themselves enemies of God. That's what he says in verse 4. You adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. That that's what we're doing. That's what we're doing when we reject the wisdom of God and, and living by the wisdom of God in our relationships with one another, and instead we buy into the wisdom of the world and live according to the wisdom of the world in our relationships with one another, and our relationships are filled by selfish ambition and bitter jealousy and all these things that he described in chapter 3 there, that it, when we do that, we're making ourselves enemies of God. And think about that, right? We're essentially telling God, no, I'm not going to live by your wisdom. I'm not going to submit to your wisdom. I'm going to be against your wisdom. I'm going to be against you. I'm going to be against what you say. I'm going to be against your wisdom. Instead, I'm going to be friends of the world. I'm going to listen to the world's wisdom and what the world says our relationship should be characterized by. And I'm going to follow the world's wisdom instead of your wisdom. I'm going to be against you. I'm your enemy. And just think about this, right? The reason then this is so important to remember in times of conflict is because in those moments, it's easy to just concentrate on the relational conflict that we're experiencing at the moment with another person. But the reality is, in those moments of relational conflict with another person, there's an even bigger and greater conflict that's going on than just the conflict that's going on between you and that other person. And that conflict is the conflict that's going on between you and God. In fact, the, the, the horizontal conflict that you're experiencing with the other person is just the result and the fruit of the vertical conflict that you're experiencing in your relationship with God. It's just the result, it's just the fruit of how you're committing adultery against God and making yourself an enemy of God by living according to the wisdom of the world and your own selfish desires. Like when you're in conflict with somebody else, you got a lot bigger problem than just that other person. The main problem isn't a horizontal relational problem here. When you're experiencing conflict in your heart toward another person, your main number one problem is the vertical problem and the vertical relationship with God that's going on there. That's what's being exposed by your selfish desires. It's that you're committing adultery against God and making yourself an enemy of God by living according to the wisdom of the world in your relationships with other people as opposed to living according to the wisdom of God. And what that means then is that if you want to resolve your horizontal conflict with others, then you first have to resolve your vertical conflict with God. Which then begs the question, how do you do that? How, how do you resolve that vertical conflict with, with God as you've been unfaithful to him and made yourself an enemy of his by following the world's wisdom and how you relate with others? How do, you, how, do you, how do you resolve that vertical relationship with God? Well, thankfully, James goes on to tell us, and this is the third step here, but the, the first way you resolve your conflict with God, and you see it on your hand out there, is by remembering the Lord's heart for you. It's by remembering the Lord's heart for you. 
And specifically two things about his heart that James tells us. First, it's that the Lord is jealous for you. That the Lord is jealous for you. This is what James goes on to say in the very next verse there in verse 5. Look there with me. After he calls his readers, after he calls us adulterers, in the very next verse, he asks them this question. He asks them in verse 5, Or do you suppose it is to no purpose that the Scripture says, He yearns jealously over the Spirit that He's made to dwell in us? Like that right there is, is one of the most beautiful verses in, in all the Bible, right? Like again, just follow James's thought here from verse 4 into verse 5. Verse 4, we're adulterers. We're enemies of God. We've rejected God's wisdom and how we are to relate to one another, and we've instead endorsed and, and, and aligned ourselves with the world's wisdom and how we're to relate to one another. So we're adulterers and enemies of God and in, in our selfish desires. We've jumped into bed with the world and followed the world's wisdom in our relationships with others and our selfish desires. But even in the midst of our unfaithfulness against him, even in the midst of our adultery against him, and even after we've made ourselves his enemy, he hasn't forsaken us. He still wants us. Verse 5 says, he still jealously longs for us to return to him. But it's even more than that. He's not just jealous for us. In verse 6, we see he also gives us more grace. Well, I love this. Look what he says in, in verse 6. He goes on to say, but he gives more grace. In other words, just feel the weight of that, right? Yes, you've been faith, unfaithful to God. Yes, you've committed spiritual adultery against him. Yes, you've made yourself an enemy of his by living according to the wisdom of the world rather than the wisdom of God in your relationships with others. You've been selfish. You've fought. You've quarreled with others. You've worshipped yourself, sought to exalt yourself in your relationship with others. But guess what? He gives more grace. Like some of y'all really need to hear that here this morning. He gives more grace. Like, do you believe that? In other words, your sin can't ever surpass God's grace. Why? Because he gives more grace. And since he gives more grace, there will always be more grace. Like God's grace doesn't have a limit. Oh, we ran out. Come back tomorrow. There's always more. There's not an expiration date. There's always more. There's always more grace. And the reason there's always more grace isn't because God just ignores your sin or just turns a blind eye to your sin and acts like it never happened. Do you realize he, he can't do that? Do you know that? He, he, he can't do that. If he just ignored it or turned a blind eye to it and act like it never happened, then that would compromise his justice. He would cease to be a just judge anymore, and therefore he would cease to be God. So he has to do something with your sin. He has to judge your sin. And that's what he did on the cross in the person of Jesus. That when Jesus died on the cross in your place, he took all the wrath of God that you deserve for your sin. He drank the last drop of God's wrath for your sin, the last drop. Meaning there's, you look at the cup of God's wrath that you deserve for your sin, there's not a drop in it left. Jesus drank it all. And because of that, all that's left in that cup is grace. Just more and more and more and more and more grace. And so then, this is the first way. You, you begin to resolve your conflict with God in the midst of your conflict with others. It's to remember the Lord's heart for you. That even in the midst of your spiritual adultery, even in the midst of your unfaithfulness toward him, he is jealous for you. He still, he still wants you. 
And he gives you even more grace. More and more and more and more and more grace. So remember the Lord's heart for you, but don't stop there. After you remember the Lord's heart for you, the next step then is to humbly repent and to turn back to him. This is the fourth step we're to take when we experience conflict with others. We're to humbly repent and turn back to the Lord. And again, this makes sense, right? Because our conflict isn't ultimately with that other person. Our conflict is ultimately with God. We're spiritual adulterers for God and enemies before God. But as we realize that, we remember God's heart for us. He's jealous for us. He, He has more grace for us. And so in light of his jealousy for us, in light of his grace for us, how do we respond? We humbly repent and turn back to him. And this is the point James makes in the rest of the passage here. Look look there with me at the rest of verse 6. Right after James says that God gives us more grace, he then quotes from Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 34, which says that God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. And so do you see what James is saying here? Do you see kind of the flow of thought that's going on here? He's saying... Verse 6, yes, God gives more grace. Yes. But he doesn't give grace to the proud and the arrogant and the self-centered people. He opposes them. He's against them. But you want to know who he gives more grace to? Opposes the proud, but he gives grace. He gives more grace to the humble. And so then what's the application here? The application is pretty straightforward, isn't it? Then humble yourself. Like in your pride, if you've been unfaithful to the Lord and forsaken the Lord's wisdom and adopted the the world's wisdom in your relationship with others, I mean, selfish ambition and bitter jealousy characterize your relationships with others and fights and quarrels. In your pride, if you live for yourself and your unselfish desires, it's all rooted in pride and selfishness and self-centeredness. But God gives more grace. He opposes the proud and gives grace to the humble. And so then, repent of your pride and your selfish desires and your fights and quarrels and live according to the world's wisdom. And humble yourself before the Lord. Which then begs this question. Well, how do you do that? How do you humble yourself before the Lord? Well, thankfully again, James tells us. And we see that in verses 7 through 10 here. The verses 7 through 10 here, what James does is he explains to us how to turn from our pride and to humble ourselves before the Lord. And here's how we do it. I'm going to fly through these real quick. First involves submitting ourselves to God. Submitting ourselves to God. This is what he says, the very first thing in verse 7 there, right? He says, submit yourselves, therefore, to God. The therefore here connects what James said in verse 6 to what James says in verse 7. In other words, since God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble, therefore, since that's true then the appropriate response is to humbly submit yourself to God. In other words, instead of submitting yourself to the world's wisdom and the world's way of thinking and the world's way of living in your relationships with others, humbly submit yourself to God and to God's wisdom in regards to how you are to relate to others. The second way we're to humble ourselves before the Lord then is to this. James says, is that we're to resist the devil. So James goes on to say in the rest of verse 7, right? Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Do you know why James is bringing up the devil here? And telling us to resist the devil? It's because what we saw at the very end of chapter 3 last week in verses 13 through 18. Because what's the devil trying to do? In chapter 3, verses 13 through 18, the devil's trying to get us to follow the world's wisdom in our relationships with others, to be selfish, to be jealous, to be proud, rather than the wisdom of God. 
That's why in verse 15, if you remember in chapter 3, James says that the wisdom of the world is characterized by bitter jealousy and selfish ambition. And he says that that wisdom is earthly, unspiritual. And then what's the third one? Remember? Demonic. Meaning it comes from the devil. I mean, the devil is trying to get you to follow the wisdom of the world and be selfish and to be bitter and to be jealous in your relationships with others. And James is saying one of the ways we humble ourselves before the Lord is that we resist the devil's temptation as he seeks us to live according to his wisdom rather than the wisdom of God in our relationships with others. Submit ourselves to God, resist the devil. Then thirdly, we're to draw near to God. It's the third way we're to humble ourselves before the Lord, to draw near to God. This is what James says next in verse 8. He says, draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. In other words, he doesn't just say resist the devil. Okay, just resist him, that's good. But he says, draw near to God. Don't just resist him, but move move toward God. And when we draw near to God in humble repentance, then James gives us this promise then God will draw near to you. Meaning he's not going to turn you away. He'll welcome and receive you back with open arms. Next then, way we humble ourselves before the Lord is to pursue holiness. It's probably a better way of of saying that. We see this in in verse 8. This is James's point in verse 8. He says, cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. And again, why is he calling them double-minded? Why is he calling us double-minded? Because this is who we are. When we live as friends with the world and friends of God, this is who we are when we follow the world's wisdom on our relationships with others, and we follow God's wisdom in our relationships with others. We're hypocrites. We're, we're double-minded. We're doing, we're doing two totally polar opposite things. And the way then that we're to respond to this double-mindedness is to cleanse our hands and to purify our hearts, which is James' call for us to repent. The next way we're to humbly repent then, James tells us, is to mourn over our sin. To mourn over our sin. This is what we see next in verse 9. Look there at verse 9. He says, be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. In other words, do you see the picture here? Like we're to mourn. We're to, we're to mourn over our love of self. We're to mourn over our our self-exaltation, our selfish desires, our fights and our quarrels with others. We're We're to mourn over that. Why? Because ultimately of what's at the root of all that. Because of the unfaithfulness, the the adultery that we're committing against God. And how we're making ourselves enemies of God in that moment. We're to mourn over that, we're to weep over that, we're to cry over that. Like, when was the last time you mourned over your sin? When was the last time you mourned over your selfishness? When was the last time you, you wept over your, your, the fights and the quarrels that you, you, you had with others? When was the last time you, you wept over your spiritual adultery against God and your unfaithfulness to God? Does the reality of that move you to tears? Like tears in and of themselves don't equal repentance. But repentance does involve tears. Wretched, mourn, weep, mourning, gloom. That all of that should characterize what's going on in our hearts when it comes to the reality of the sin in our hearts, particularly as it relates to our unfaithfulness to the Lord, and our spiritual adultery against Him. Which then leads to verse, the last way we humble ourselves, and this isn't really a a way we humble ourselves, this is really a promise of what will happen if we humble ourselves before the Lord. But James says this in verse 10. He says, kind of as a summary statement here, humble yourselves before the Lord. And here's what God will do at the end of verse 10. He will exalt you. Meaning at the end of this age, when Jesus returns back to this earth, then he will resurrect your dead body out of the ground. 
and he'll give you a perfect glorified body and he will exalt you and you will rule and reign with the exalted Savior Jesus forever and ever and ever here on this earth. But here's the point we're, we're supposed to see here. Do you see the irony in all this? Do you see the irony in all this? This is the thing that we've been craving all along, right? <laughs> in our selfish passions and our selfish desires, we, we, we've been pursuing our own exaltation, our, our own glory. But the irony in all this is that the way to glory and exaltation isn't by pursuing our own selfish ambition and living for our own selfish desires like the world tells us to do. Instead, the way to glory and exaltation is through humility. It's through humbling ourselves in repentance to the Lord. Which was the way of whom? except for the repentance part, is the way of Jesus, Philippians chapter 2, who although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be exploited for his own selfish gain and his own selfish benefit. But instead, he humbled himself even by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. And as a result of Jesus' humility, then as a result of that, what did God do? God highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above all names so that in the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. But that's God's promise to all those who will humble themselves before him. He promises to exalt you. And because of that, you don't have to try and exalt yourself in this life. You don't have to pursue your glory and your selfish passions and your selfish desires and your own self-worship and exaltation here in this life. Instead, you can humble yourself and humbly come under him and submit to him, draw near to him, and he promises that he will exalt you. And so then let's close with this. Let's put all this together, right? Four steps. The next time you begin to grow frustrated and upset and irritated with your spouse, with your kid, with friend, with boss, fellow church member, whoever else, here are the steps to follow. Step number one, understand the ultimate source of your conflict isn't the other person. It's you. It's the selfish desires in your heart. Do they have a part to play in terms of their own sin before the Lord and all that? Yes. Yes, but the ultimate source of the conflict that you're experiencing, the fight and the quarrels and the conflict and the anger in your heart, isn't that other person. It's, it's the selfish desires in your heart. Step number two then, understand how serious that is. Understand the deeper meaning of what's happening as you're experiencing those selfish desires in your heart. You're committing spiritual adultery because you're following the wisdom of the world. You're getting in bed with the wisdom of the world and living according to the wisdom of the world in your relationships with others. And therefore, you're committing spiritual adultery against God, being unfaithful to Him, and making yourself an enemy of God. And therefore, your greater conflict that's going on isn't between you and that other person, it's between you and God. And that's what has to be dealt with. So then how do you do that? Step number three. Remember his heart for you. Remember that in the midst of your unfaithfulness, in the midst of your adultery, and making him your enemy, in the midst of seeking your own glory, not his, he's still jealous for you. He wants you. And he gives you more grace. And let the reality then of his jealousy for you and the grace that he's extending toward you let the reality of that then lead you into step number four, which is then to humbly repent of your pride and humbly repent of your selfishness and humbly repent of your adultery and unfaithfulness against him. By following what we just saw in verses seven through 10. And when you do that, and when that vertical conflict 
with the Lord gets resolved. It's pretty amazing how that horizontal conflict just somehow disappeared. Where'd it go? And the reason it disappeared isn't because your boss disappeared or your wife disappeared or your four-year-old disappeared. The reason it disappeared is because your selfish desires disappeared. And because your selfish desires disappeared, somehow, someway, those fights and quarrels disappeared as well. But the only way for that to happen isn't the first and foremost deal with that relational conflict. It's to humbly repent and to resolve that vertical conflict that you're experiencing in your relationship with the Lord. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you that you speak even to practical areas of our lives that are hard and difficult, and, but that we can all relate to. So God, I pray just for anyone here just could resonate with this passage and these 10 verses and just think of instances and maybe even walking in here this morning with just, man, just anger and murderous thoughts and just jealousy and just selfish desires and just fighting and quarreling in their own heart and their own mind with somebody. God, I pray that they would see that their primary problem isn't that somebody, but that it's ultimately with you. And I pray that even during this time and during this prayer, during the Lord's Supper, during the singing that we're about to do, that, that they would humbly, first, that they would remember your heart toward them. That even though they've blown it, even maybe even this morning, and their heart isn't in the right spot towards somebody else, pray that they would remember your heart toward them, that you haven't forsaken them, you are jealous for them, you want them, and there's more grace available to them. Now pray that the reality of your jealousy and the reality of the grace that's available to them would compel them to humbly repent of their pride and their selfish desires. And that they would submit to you and draw near to you and experience and to know the grace that you've promised them. And experience and know the exaltation that they'll experience in a small kind of spiritual brief way in the here and now. But they'll experience in a whole new way when Jesus returns. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.